This is the Other 22 Hours Podcast. Hey, and welcome to this week's episode of the Other 22 Hours Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron schaefer Hayes, And I'm your other host, Michaela Ann. And we are so happy to still be here. It's our second year in the Other 22 Hours and no sign of stopping. And really glad you're here with us. A few quick asks before we jump into today's episode. It takes a lot to produce even a small show like ours. We've boiled our simple asks down to three things being subscribe and share. So what that means is if you could really quick, just click subscribe or follow or whatever the word they use on your listening platform of choice. That's just a really quick and easy way for people that are like browsing the show to know that it's worth 45 minutes of their time at least once. Secondly would be share, which is to share your favorite episode or clip with somebody that doesn't know about our show yet. I would like to think that this show is from our community for our community. And so what that means is chances are there's somebody in your circle that could really benefit from these conversations that doesn't know about it yet. And the larger our community is, the more guests we can have and the more ideas we can share with you guys. So it creates this really cool feedback loop. And lastly is if you know that you enjoy our show, Streaming podcasts pays absolutely zero dollars. So we've started a Patreon and there we offer the normal Patreon things, behind the scenes stuff, advanced notice of guests. So you can ask questions directly. We have conversations that are starting every week amongst creatives that subscribe to kind of go deeper into what we talk about on this show. And we love that it's kind of like a living, breathing organism and constantly changing. So if that sounds intriguing to you, there is a link below in our show notes. And one of the things we really pride ourselves on with this podcast is that we are not music journalists. We are working musicians ourselves. So we think of these less as interviews and more as conversations where it's almost like we're sitting together at the dinner table, having a really honest, vulnerable conversation about the realities of building a lifelong career around your art. Which is a crazy thing to do, as we all know. And that's because most of the things in this career are completely outside of our control, which we spend a good bit of time talking about with our guests today. But with that, we've distilled our show down to a thesis statement of what do you do to create sustainability in your life so that you can sustain your creativity? And today we got to ask that question of The Lone Bellow. The Lone Bellow is a band based in Nashville, originally started out in New York City, made up of Zach Williams, Bren Elmquist, and Kaneen Pipkin. And they have been a band for over 10 years, which a band of any size is incredibly hard to sustain. So it's quite an accomplishment. They put out several records produced by Dave Cobb and Aaron Dessner of The National, their most recent record being self-produced for the first time. Yeah, and we get to dive into that idea of betting on yourself, taking things into your own hand, a lot of talk in like relationships with your team and expectations being met, being not met, how attention is the sign of health in a relationship and openness and confidence in the strength of a relationship. This is the first time that we've had a trio on the show of unrelated people. So getting to talk on the dynamics of that, as Kaneen says, it's kind of like being in a marriage with people that you never fell in love with, which I really love. There's some stories of their times, missing train accidents with major label deals, a label closing a month before they put out a record, some wild up and downs, a whole lot of skinned knees along the way to arrive where they are, which is taking ownership of everything, both their creativity and their personal lives and their career. And so with that, here's our conversation with the Lone Bella. You remember when someone thought that my wife was a homeless person in that parking lot? She like gave her socks and it's just because my <laughs> wife dresses like a homeless person. A very wow. chic, incredibly chic unhoused yeah. person. Yeah, she had like these number nine shoes on. I don't know if people know what they are. They were really expensive and she never wears socks with them. And this person that used to be homeless came out and was like, I was where you were one day. My wife oh, wow. didn't have the heart to tell her that she had a home that she lived in. So she took the lady's socks. <laughs> <laughs> with her expensive yeah. shoes. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for doing this. We realize we've all never met, but we have a lot of mutual friends. We lived in Brooklyn for 12 years before we moved here. Her oh, wow. Where are you guys at right now in your path and tour cycles and life? As friends, we have harvested all there is the harvest. And we're at home like writing songs and making music and being with our families. And it's a nice place to be in. Cause yeah, when we came back from the pandemic, we were broke and it was time to go to work. And 
Nobody talked to the other musicians and said, should we stagger? We all went out and flooded a market that just couldn't handle it. And that's changed now. I mean, live music is more alive than it's ever been. And I'm really excited to be a part of that because we've always been a live band. It's been a staple of what we do. Right now, I think, at least speaking for me, it's been kind of like sowing seeds. And I'm sure there'll be a time to like go back out and harvest of those seeds. But we've got most of the record in the can, if not all of it. We're still writing and we're not going to release the record until next year. So if we write another song that feels like it should make the record, we'll record it. And it's a nice place to be in. We're not playing catch up now, which is a really, it took us 12 years to do that. But for me, it just takes a little weight off my shoulders to know that we're looking at the horizon instead of like catching up, you know what I mean? Mm. So I'm really proud is the first thing that I'd say to us. More excited about the future that I have been in a couple of record cycles, honestly. I think we're starting on record label. We're starting some things that we're really proud of that we're keeping to ourselves until we get there. But beginning next year, it all starts rolling out and we just take back a lot more stake in what we do. We have a more fan centric. How do we take care of our fans? How do we love on these people that have carried us, paid our bills for so long? If I was saying like a state of the union, that's what I would say, like we're at for me. Do you guys find that at this point you're able to move as like an organism or is it still kind of like a democratic process? Well, obviously we never disagree or fight. (laughs) (laughs) I think some things this far down the road are pretty seamless. I think we're all a pretty similar mind. And I think a lot more often now, it's a matter of allowing everyone to kind of work in their strengths. I think too, because we're not really the kind of people that are happy ever doing the same thing twice. Like we don't want to do the same set with the nights in a row. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's always an evolution just like within how we're operating. And so I think there's always discussion that's happening. I think there has to be a certain amount of tension just so you know everybody still cares. Because if it's mm-hmm. just kind of like, yeah, whatever, then it feels a little bit checked out. But I think on, on the important things, vision-wise, they're, like, they're pretty much on the same footage. Do you guys find that kind of opens up, adds some freedom in the creative process, you know, where there is an inspiration or an openness to bring ideas to the table, bring your own voices? I know you guys all write independently and have your own things, but then when it comes down to writing stuff for the band, how does that work? The record we're doing now is probably my favorite. There's been a thousand different versions of how we write songs together. The last one, we were together the whole time. So we wrote it in a church. We wrote most of it in a church right down the road. This one, we went to Kentucky and went to a friend's firehouse. We talked to the bass player and the drummer, and we asked them, like, will you sit and write these songs with us? And we'll just split everything. We've never done that. Mm-hmm. Um, just buy in from everybody that we're just going to go and jam out. Like we're in a garage and like we were 16. And there was no preconceived ideas about it, only that we were going to just go in and try our best to do what we do. And uh, we wrote 11 songs in a four days, Jam and Arrow. We had a ball. It made me love my band members even more. A couple weeks later, I was like, I think we have a record. And I talked to everybody individually and everybody together. And they agreed. And so we picked up some straggling songs that we liked along the way. And we went down to Muscle Shoals and we spent another week. And then we, piece it together after that. The older I get, the more I like to invite folks into the process. I really don't like doing anything alone. And I can get more done when I've got all my friends involved. And it is contention, and there's supposed to be contention in art. If you're not butting your heads, it's not worth it because you don't have your heart regained. Me and Kaneem butt heads all the time. You know, it's beautiful. And we talk about it and we hug after it. I think you got to have a safe place to do that. Honestly, we talk about our band and what we do. That's what we do the best. Everything else is just an outflow of that. I, as my part playing this band, want to protect the most. We talk about how we tour and how we make records and stuff like that. It's got to be foreign and it needs to make the most amount of money for the work we put into it because we're grown. I feel like if we have the best experience for ourselves, then our fans will have the best experience. That's just how music works. And I've literally heard other people that I really look up to, Rick Rube and all these people, they say the same thing. You have to do your four chords in the truth, three chords in the truth, and then hopefully it's worth listening to. You know what I mean? And that's the philosophy. Yeah, I love that you brought up the tension and how it's a good sign to see tension because it means that you all are showing up as your strongest selves. And I feel like there's a lot of culture these days of like how tension or disagreement can be like make it or break it. 
having examples of people talk about like, yeah, we disagree and that's okay. Like disagreements aren't bad. It's actually like a sign of strength. And then how we handle those disagreements, especially in like a creative way is really beautiful that you might have different opinions about how a song should go and feel really strongly about it and be able to move on in a good place together from there is a really beautiful example of not running away from discomfort and thinking that discomfort is inherently bad. I can imagine that being in a long running trio, essentially having three front people can lead to a lot of traffic jams or roadblocks or something like that. For me, it's inspiring to hear that there's an openness like that and ability to be like, we're all humans and people and we have opinions and different tastes and that is our strength and how do we lean into that yeah for sure i don't think it works in the other way honestly it's making elevator music <laughs> yeah it's not being in sure. your opinion but i think you have to lean in and it's a sign of being an adult to be able to like but and then bug afterwards you know i think our society's changed so much to where they try to take all the conflict out i don't think that's the way to do it we definitely shouldn't be a-holes or run people over, but mm -hmm. we shouldn't be afraid to disagree with somebody. I think that's healthy. Yeah. It's so funny though, because you say it's a sign of being an adult, which I agree. It's like a maturity that you grow and learn. But at the same time, having a three-year-old, I'm like watching these toddlers like just brutalize each other and then be fine. And I'm like, oh, we could learn a lot from them. <laughs> they're like mad at well, each other. They're a lot yeah. faster. And yeah. then they're like so happy to be together. <laughs> so it's a good lesson. Yeah, I think if anything, if you're going to have a long relationship, especially like a band is such an interesting organism because it's your friends and you're working together and it's like being in like a marriage with a bunch of people you mm -hmm. never fell in love with. <laughs> There's a reason that we all gravitated toward this it's because when it's awesome, it is so fun. You get to be with your friends and be in a community and create and do all that. You're not just like going to a job with a bunch of people you're not invested in. It's like a very integrated way to live. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to learn. I think we've gotten really good at like, if something is bothering us, we have to talk about it a lot earlier than we used to. Because I think we used to all just, we would get mad, we would get upset, and then you would just sit on it. And then it would come out in these moments when other things needed to be addressed. You know, if you want it to last, you got to find a way to work through things, work through the hurt and not resent each other because people can see that on stage. I don't know if you've ever mm. seen a band where you're like, these people are fighting, but it's not a great feeling unless you're into that. <laughs> <laughs> excited about Oasis. I don't like being on the other side of it, yeah. Oh, I'm excited about Oasis. That's the conflict sure. I've been looking for right there. <laughs> <laughs> can you guys talk a little bit about how, do you guys have to separate times of okay, we need to have like a business meeting and talk about our plans and schedules and how has that also evolved? If I'm correct, Zach, were you the only one that had children when the band started? And then as families have grown, how have you guys kind of incorporated yeah. addressing everybody's personal schedules and how those conversations go? I think that we need to be better at it, but basically to protect the like normal hang time. I think that it's a good idea to have the businessy meetings so that the businessy crap doesn't just fall into any given moment. We're going to have this serious conversation about that. We want to just be able to be, you know, especially when you're together so much. I think that it's really important to set aside and have those business meetings so that you're not just like quietly wondering, okay, on this four hour drive, is someone going to bring up something really intense. Yeah, I agree though. I think it's super important to just be intentional about that with the business because when it's your livelihood and when it's a livelihood that is also dependent on other people that are your close friends, it's really easy for emotion to creep in there. And business is not necessarily a place for emotion. You know, it can be numbers, it can be math, it can be like schedules, it can be very tangible cut and dry things. And so if you're able to just carve out a time for that, then the personal time, the creative time, whatever it is, has the untethered freedom to be that. In my experience, it kind of seems like both things can kind of thrive. Yeah, for sure. I think right. it's also like having the, the team that you trust around is a big piece. I feel like a lot of times, especially in the beginning, you get a manager with a big name and you're like, he's going to do everything. And then like five years down the road, you realize, oh, it's all on me still, really, mm -hmm. or us. 
We have to carry the load. It's our ideas. But then you realize, oh, so we want somebody that we really want to like collaborate with. And I feel like that's something that's changed lately too, that I'm really happy about because you got people that's hungry and want to come up with fresh ideas and new ways of doing this stuff. And it's really good to have those kind of people around too. And they're also like wondering, I don't know about this. What do you think? I'm in a silo and they can like look at it with a different lens than you. It's cool to have people like that you trust around. For sure. Those decisions, is there generally a consensus there or is there a lot of negotiating that needs to happen amongst the three of you guys? It's happened a few times. It's been a little different every time. It usually takes a couple months to really walk through and figure out if it's the best decision or not. I will say I've gotten better at firing people over the years. First couple of times, it was really, really uncomfortable. They tried to put on like a father figure hat and I didn't know what to do with that. And mm. it was like, you owe everything to me. What are you doing? You're hurting me. And after doing it a couple of times and like seeing that was like a move, it was way better, especially this last time to just cut it off. Just be like, nope, we're adults. You haven't done a good job. Have a good life. Bye. Kind of thing. But yeah, in the band, these decisions are just such big decisions and we have so much tied to it. For instance, like when we changed lawyers, it was really hard. We were going from a lawyer that took 5% of everything we made to a lawyer that was just paid hourly. And the guy that we were leaving was a sweet guy, but he naturally took it really personal. It's just not fair. It's not fair to do that in the professional realm. And I think that people that are on the business side of music know that an artist probably has some people pleasing issues. And that's one of the reasons why they maybe subconsciously became an artist. We try to take advantage of that in the firing conversation. So it has been nice to just learn those little things and also to go have the conversation and then have your friends slash bandmates to like sit back in the green room with and be like, oh my God, this is how it went. And then we all <laughs> process it together kind of thing. If I just had to do it on my own, I would replay every part of that convo for weeks until I like went crazy. But to mm -hmm. be able to like go back and be like, okay, he said this and I said this and get your friends opinions on it is so helpful. Yeah, I can imagine having that fallback to kind of check in with and just be like, that was crazy, right? And having the feedback of like, yeah, that was crazy. <laughs> I've never been a front man. I was a, you know, on tour as a sideman for a long time. And now I produce records and stuff. Michaela and I have been together for 17 years. So I've seen her have to make these big decisions essentially on her own. You know, I can add feedback, but it's her band is her name and her path. So I can imagine the little confidence boost of having other opinions there. I can imagine that when you guys do come to a decision, it seemingly would be a little easier to sit in that decision because it's been processed multiple times. There's multiple opinions already in there. Well, and I think, yeah. Zach, what you pointed out of the challenging power dynamic between artists or bands and industry people of the like parental figure, I've experienced that so many times. And it's really hard to remind yourself that when you're in a position of, okay, there's these business people that have access and they're going to help me or my band, but remembering that really how it's supposed to operate is that they're working for you. Right. It's so hard to remember that you're the boss, especially if you're not like selling as many tickets as you think you should be or have as much money coming in as you think you should be. And manipulation is so common that's unfortunate and i'm always careful to not vilify business people and also like i worked at a record label when i was right out of college and feel like i got a different perspective having that be my first job but you know i had experiences with powerful booking agents who gave me the whole talk of like when i sign an artist i sign them for life and we're in this together and like this whole emotional like <laughs> And then that was not true at all. When I got pregnant, all of a sudden we weren't in it for life together. So I think it's a really good reminder, and especially for a young artist starting out listening to this podcast, no matter what you leverage or power you think you have operating in this system, knowing that people are working for you and not letting yourself get manipulated by name and power so that you feel so disempowered that you lose track of what your artistic vision and purpose is and then not able to run your business because you're trusting people based purely on, oh, I hope they help me. I'll do whatever they say. Mm -hmm. An artist is the power. It's everything. We are. 
yes, there's people that can help and all that stuff, but everybody's coming along is going off your energy. I think younger kids may be learning a little faster. It's all about the songs you're writing and stuff like that. And if, if you've got that together, like everybody who's gonna follow you, if you've got the right things put together, they're gonna come behind your business and stuff like that. It's a crazy thing to say like, this person's got the power to do this and that. And there are powerful people, but if you're doing great work, people are gonna want to be around you. And that's just how it works. You like mm -hmm. you have your own gravitational pull. Yeah, and remembering that whatever leverage you think you have or power you think you have changes. It's so easy to think that our power as artists is determined by our numbers and the data that business people might be looking at. And that stuff can change so fast. So it just takes a lot of continual confidence, believing in yourself rather than thinking, okay, anybody out there who's going to give me help. And remembering that for us, for a band, for an artist, this is our whole thing. But these business people are tending to lots of other things. End a conversation like, okay, we need to handle these things. We're going back. That's all that's on our mind. But then they're getting off that call, like having to tend to 10 different emails and multiple other artists they're working with. So like the lag time, the different directions they're all pulled in is very different from what it is for us to operate our business. Yeah. Speaking on all of that, I guess kind of we've been tiptoeing around the word gatekeepers. There are people in this industry that inevitably need to be on your team for certain doors to open and certain things to happen. One of which we talk a lot about really recently on this show it seems like the last five months that conversations have really changed but like is starting your own label is master ownership is kind of betting on yourself and being like man i don't know if we really need a label to do that anymore you know have they lost their influence have they lost that i'm just wondering like what were some of the decisions or conversations you guys had that was like man now's the time to do this to bet on ourselves take ownership and grab the steering wheel on the label side of things I think one of the most powerful moments that we had with that was right after the pandemic. We had always had the honor of working with these like successful producers, whether it was Aaron Desner or Dave Cobb or even Charlie Peacock. I was in the mindset where I was like, we need this outside guy every time. Help us make a good sounding record. And Brian was like, I want to try it without them. and. It was really scary, but then after we got our feet wet and we were in the studio and we were making the record and we were having fun, I was like, I'm sure we'll make a record with another producer on our own timeline whenever we want, but it sure is nice knowing now that we don't need that to make the music that we love. And I think that was a really big kind of growing moment. And Brian brought that to the table and I'm glad that Kaneen and I trusted him and followed suit with that. That feeling of like, oh, I need this producer, whether it's conscious or subliminal, like this thought, like we're not good enough as we are in whatever shape or form that might take. I'm saying this fully knowing that I've spent my time in my studio here helping people make records. One of my favorite things is the first sentence in Glenn John's book. All it takes to be a producer is an opinion and the confidence to convince everybody in the room that you're right. And it's really like <laughs> laughable, but like, it's kind of, that's what it is. <laughs> Brian, do you have that tattooed on your, on your lower back? You know, sometimes people put vocabulary to things that you can't say out loud. <laughs> <laughs> when I do a long bell record, it's different than another record because it's and Ganeen or equal. So we do it and it's a lot more that to go to with this band when we produce a record, but I like it. I love it. I wouldn't tend to think it's like. Me and me, go back to it. Like one of these songs she wrote, I think it's the best song that I've ever been a part of. I show it to everybody in the middle of it. She went and the other guy wrote the song and I love these melodies and stuff like that. And she came back upstairs, I got a song. And I was like, with that, I wanted to do that. You know, so like it took us after the song was done to get to a good place on it. But if we didn't as a group create some of the coolest things I've ever heard, honestly, I knew that we could do it because we'd been in the rooms with these people and I knew what they were doing and they had a John Lowe. So all I needed was a John Lowe. Mm -hmm. I needed a good engineer and we all could do that. It doesn't take anything away from Aaron Desner or Dave Cobb. Dave Cobb just made an insane record for the Red Clay Strays. The last Chris Stapleton record is the best record Dave Cobb's ever made. So he's mm -hmm. on the top of his game. But anyway, I thought we could do it together and we did. And the Love Songs for Losers is the testament of us just like believing in each other, I think. 
And that's mm-hmm. food or the same thing. Was that part of your decision of the building that confidence and your ability to produce together to then decide, all right, let's also take business back into our own hands and start our own label? Yeah, probably subconsciously for me, at least it was like, okay, this last record that we made, I was like, hey, this song is the single. And it felt good when the single that they picked didn't work. And then the one that I picked worked. I was like, all right, maybe getting pretty good at this. Maybe we can do this on our own. I just think in general, the past couple of years since we made Love Songs for Losers, we just like have been looking under the hood and we're like, you know what? We're obviously dedicated to this. This is what we're doing with our lives. Let's make it as beautiful as possible. Let's bring in the people that we love working with and let's remind ourselves that no one is going to, not in a rebellious way, literally no one's going to tell us what to do. There was a while there where we were like, hey, why isn't the management like telling us what to do? Hmm. And we like finally learned, oh, that's not really their role. And this is all like inside baseball stuff, but it sounds like that's what your podcast listeners are are here for. Yes, to the degree that people are comfortable sharing this stuff. Mm -hmm. We say that this podcast is like anti-promotion, anti-album cycle. We're not trying to like promote your latest thing. We're trying to like be in service of each other and build a community. We find the conversation so much more fruitful and so much more inspiring, at least for us, when we're able to talk to people like you guys who have seen both views from the top of the mountain and like sitting on your ass at the bottom of the valley, like what now? My favorite moment of the like top of the mountain, it was when we were trying to put out our first record, there was a bidding war between, I think, Warner Brothers and Universal and Atlantic was in the mix a little bit, but it was mostly between Warner Brothers and Universal and the universe decided for us that we weren't going to go with Warner Brothers or Universal. And then like three weeks later, Warner Brothers fired everyone that was trying to get us on the record label. And they were like, we'll be mm-hmm. your forever thing. We're a family. Da, da, da. And then bam, they're all fired, except for like two of them. And yeah. then we found out that that was like a norm. That was like a thing that happened with major labels a lot. We've had a, the honor of being able to work with Jay Heron, Sony ATV, and Descendant. Descender. And then working with the guys at Gold Town has been so fun. We all live in the neighborhood. Daniel Higby, I could throw a ball over that mountain. Throw and it would hit his house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's like right there. But yeah, it was alarming to be like, oh man, your whole staff could just be fired. I mean, when we were releasing our third record, and Brian Canine, tell me if I'm wrong, I think that the record closed while we were about to release our third record. They were just no. like, we're sorry, goodbye. Yeah, the record label closed for sure. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, it's just believe in yourself. <laughs> yeah. I think that goes so far, both business-wise and creativity-wise. You know, it's no secret that people aren't running to Sam Goody to pay $18 because I heard one song on the radio. And so to me, the value in records these days is longevity and shelf life and having it be timeless. You know, I grew up on the band and the Talking Heads and all of these bands that you hear 15 seconds, you're like, oh, it's these people because they were so grounded in who they were and what their voice was and what their vision was. And then a record stands as that. It's a record of where you as a band and as writers were at that time. And you can listen to it 20 years from now and it'll feel fresh. You as an artist will still be proud of it rather than chasing that major label deal and the sound that's going to get you on that major label deal. And you know, Mm. what's going to get you on the top of that, whatever new music Friday playlist or whatever it is, you know, just being grounded in what you are, what you want, what you need and what your vision is. It gives people something to follow to use the followers term. Well, it's also a good reminder that the only thing we can control is the music we make. But all of that stuff of like your record label closing down the month of your release or I had like my publicist quit the week that my record came out. And like there's so many things that are completely out of our control. That's just timing and luck. And we always personalize it. My success would be determined if I'm good enough. And that's just not how it works, unfortunately. No. (laughs) it doesn't work like that we released our record two weeks before the pandemic then the record's beautiful we sit airing up for winning grammys with taylor swift we are (laughs) 
<laughs> and you have no control over it and no control over the outcome. The only thing you have control over is, is this the best representation of what I do right now? Mm -hmm. And I know that's a hard thing to do, but you can't chase anything. You got to do it. It's just right. It feels right to you. And hopefully mm -hmm. people want to listen to it. And you have all the other factors, you know? I'm curious if you guys are comfortable just talking about the balance of also where a lot of your income and livelihood is dependent on going on tour, how you guys construct that schedule with what is needed and necessary financially, and also having young children or children of all ages, not to be biased against fathers, <laughs> but particularly Kaneen from the, the mother's perspective, because I have this conversation all the time. It's still like such a like a how as a mom, especially when the babies are young, like, how do you do it? I get asked this even as I do it. I'm like, I still always want to know how everybody else does it. <laughs> so my uh, grandma always claimed she was related to Sacagawea, mm -hmm. the Cragawea, mm -hmm. who led Lewis and Clark through the wilderness with a baby on her back. Mm -hmm. And I literally had a picture of Sacagawea that I would look at and I would just think about her literally every day. Mm. Like, she can do it, I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's hard. And I feel like I've talked to a lot of women here about the trepidation that is going to come with being pregnant on the road, having a little one on the road, all that. I think at the very beginning when I first found out I was pregnant, there were some people on our team who I had to talk down, mm -hmm. who I think decided that they wanted to process all of their fears about what if I couldn't do it anymore? What mm -hmm. if I was like, what if the baby gets sick? What if yada yada? And I was kind of like being in a band and being a musician, at least for now, before the AI overlords take over, it's a human endeavor. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all like, what if any of us get sick? What if any of us, whatever. So I kind of had to see it from that way. It was honestly, it was probably being really pregnant on the road. I think I was like 39 weeks pregnant. We played New Orleans Jazz Fest. Oh my gosh. Standing with my enormous belly watching Snoop Dogg. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> At least people were in inflatable penis costumes on the stage with <laughs> yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, it was like, awesome. What? <laughs> What's happening right now? Everyone's like, so what? Well, we get drunk. <laughs> so what? Well, we remember the day they're like about to go into labor. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's fun. You feel super conspicuous, mm -hmm. which hopefully you're like a little okay with if you've chosen to be a performer. Mm -hmm. um, but I think having like a newborn baby, taking him down to the green room, which was like full of other bands, who's screaming, I need to feed him. No one moved for me to sit. So I like nursed him on a toilet seat in a mm -hmm. bathroom, mm -hmm. not even like the lid. There's yeah. no like toilet seat yeah. like, on the room. I've done that too. <laughs> yeah. 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 So you're like, this is my life now. And it's just like one more thing. I think touring's always kind of like that. It's hard. There's a lot. You're going through life. You're a person in a body. And then bringing another kid into it, just it's like another thing to take care of. There are definitely ways I would do it differently now. Mm -hmm. I honestly don't know if I could physically and mentally do it again. Mm -hmm. But I think for all moms and women in the industry, like there are a lot more female musicians around than I feel like even when we started. But mm -hmm. it's still, I still feel like an anomaly. And I feel like a lot of people who are a little more old school in their thoughts, it's kind of like they're doing you a favor, letting you be there. And I think when I had a baby and we were bringing a baby into all of these backstages and stuff, I was really hyper aware of not inconveniencing anybody and him just not being in the way and really minimizing his needs and my needs to a really detrimental amount that I haven't really fully processed or like talked through with everyone because it was hard. And I think if I was to do it again or any advice I give to people, it's just like, speak up. You have a place there. This is how the human race goes forward. Babies are normal. Mm -hmm. um, they might not be normal where you are, but tell people what you need. Find people who want to help and support you and just believe in that because, you know, my bandmates were very supportive and I think I was still just afraid. I was afraid that I was bothering people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is my thing that I really needed to learn how to get over is like the fear of being annoying or like being whatever. An um, inconvenience. An inconvenience and always needing to be perfect and totally unproblematic. I think a lot of women struggle with that. I think it's very difficult to feel like show ready and creative and full of energy when you are caring for a child, but it can be done. And I think a lot of it is just being honest with yourself, people around you, ask for what you need. From my perspective, we've toured a lot with our child and mostly it's been, I'm just there basically for childcare and Michaela will tour either in like an <laughs> yeah. acoustic trio or solo. And we're always touring in a van or a Subaru or not on a bus. Yeah. Right. And I can definitely sympathize and 
back up with that feeling with mothers of like not wanting to rock the boat, not wanting to like take up space or cause any more struggle. In my observation, I've seen, like you said, people in your team were processing their own emotions around your pregnancy. Yeah, I definitely view that with Michaela. This very vigilant watch on like, is the mom handling it? Is everything okay? Where like, I've seen men that are new fathers just be like an absolute hot mess. There's kind of like a little bit more patience of like, well, of course, yeah, there's like a newborn, like they're doing it. My experience is I became a new dad and all of a sudden, in my view, I was treated with like more respect and more class. Like, well, he's a dad now. Like he needs, we need to pay him more. Like we can't afford to take you out for three weeks, but what about like a weekend? Like that kind of thing where it's like, whoa, (laughs) this is the same, relatively the same life change here. Why am I getting respect while she's getting an inquisitive look? You have a baby in a bar. Yeah. It feels like that's the the bar. (laughs) Or if, if I'm ever out by myself, like I'm leaving for a tour tonight alone, I often get questioned like, who's with your child? I'm like, she has another parent. (laughs) But I'm curious if like the same concern was expressed when Zach or Brian were having children. It's usually just people don't know what to talk about. So they just bring that up. It's like when a fan comes up and they're like, I saw you in Vermont. Da, 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 da. And you're like, okay, I don't remember. I don't know what to say. And then mm-hmm. especially when it's like, well, what about here or here or here or here? I just felt like it was always kind of a talking point. So I was just waiting to talk about something else. The hard thing for me was a lot of people assumed I would quit. A lot of people were just like, oh, well, then you won't do this anymore. Yeah. That was a bad room. People say weird uh, things to Kadeen anyway. Now when she has a kid, they would never say things to me in the morning at an airport, but they'll, like a random stranger will say something to her. And I'm like, people are dumb. <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> like, I don't know why. Yeah, Brian's right. There's a lot of wonderful people out there. And then there's people where you're just like, hey man, you're talking to a human, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Talk to a person. We try to talk about this because I was really shocked at that experience when I got pregnant of how many people asked me, like, are you going to tour anymore or you're not going to go back to work? Like thinking I was going to quit. Literally, my booking agent just sighed and was like, oh, God, this is going to be so hard. And then like we stopped working together. It felt like this liability. And this second time around, I have this same fear of, oh, I'm marked. People are just going to assume, oh, she's really going to quit now because she has a second kid. That's even more impossible. And I feel like I have that anxiety. So my my response is instead of I hear women say like, oh, then I feel like we need to hide our children in our music careers and not show like that we have families. And I'm having the opposite reaction of like, I'll probably annoy people with how much I talk about being a mother because I'm just like, it's possible even for men too. I don't think it's only women who experience this. I think it's a music industry culture that I think a lot of people are talking more about. But I do think it's a different experience for women. I mean, people say weird things to y'all. One of our very first shows, we were opening for the Civil Wars. This is like before we had a CD out or anything. Mm-hmm. And this lady that was in the audience wrote this really long letter about the things we were doing well and all the things that she personally would change. Oh. <laughs> and one of them were like, the men in the band should not wear wedding rings. You need to let the audience like... Think you're available. <laughs> fantasize about it. <laughs> the only told me I needed to wear one long dangly earring. I think she is the chimp crazy lady. She's Florida woman. But it's funny, like some people, like, why don't you want someone to talk about their wife or kids? Like, yeah. doesn't that make them more interesting? It feels like an archaic uh, view that like musicians are supposed to only just be like a fantasy for people and not whole humans. Or they're just supposed to be tragic, drug addicted, die young cautionary tales. Mm-hmm. And if John Prine was the biggest rock star ever when he was in his friggin' 70s, there's more to be had as you get older. Sure. Definitely. I just have to note that you guys got like a unsolicited full page review uh, <laughs> career advice from a woman in the audience. And that's just so rare. Maybe because I'm with Michaela, <laughs> but that, that seems like a space that's like exclusively reserved for 60 year old men. 60 year old men. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you just need to tour Florida more, is all I have to say on that. <laughs> Oh, man. It was so specific. That's hilarious. I mean, being musicians, I do feel like it opens you up to, like, people just think they can say anything or that they know you. It's like a whole other weird emotional uh, boundary-less experience that you have to combat sometimes. 
Anyways, we don't want to take any more of your time. Thank you so much for sharing so generously just about your experiences. Appreciate you guys. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. All right, guys. guys. Appreciate it. Hey, real quick before we wrap up today's episode, it takes a lot to produce even a small show like ours. So if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider taking a minute to check out our Patreon. There's a lot happening over there, all with the intent of growing our community and offering you more resources to navigate a career based on your art more sustainably. You can learn more at the link in the show notes below. Thanks for being here with us, and we'll catch you next time on the Other 22 Hours podcast.